welcome to another episode of In Focus brought to you by the Wongozi Institute. My name is Gwamaka Kifukwe. Ladies and gentlemen, as you're aware, our societies are increasingly interconnected and interdependent. They're also facing challenges that they can't solve alone, such as climate change, international terrorism, and financial instability. For these and for other reasons, global governance, which is the international collective effort to tackle such issues and manage them, has never been more relevant or important as it is today. Joining me in studio today to reflect on the institutions that are tasked with global governance and their effectiveness and challenges that they face, I'm honored to be joined by Ambassador Augustine Mahiga. He is the former permanent representative of Tanzania to the United Nations and while there has also served as a special representative and head of the UN Political Office for Somalia. Ambassador Mahiga, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the program. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation. I just want to start the interview off by asking you, when we consider the sort of current institutions that are charged with overseeing and facilitating global governance, uh, in your opinion, are they adequate to the task given how the world is evolving? First of all, as a matter of principle, we must admit that global governance institutions are desirable and necessary among nation states. But the state of play of global institutions is an evolving process which began with the end of the Second World War after the collapse of the previous institutions, namely the League of Nations and the other institutions around it. With the onset and the coming of the United Nations and followed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the institutions have gradually been built around the United Nations as global interdependence has grown. They are therefore marching and trying to cope with international demands for multilateralism and interdependence. And to be honest, the institutions are lagging behind the challenges before the global community. And therefore, in number and quality, they have to be improved. I mean, you mentioned now that they're, they're, they're lagging behind. Is it because they have too wide a mandate? Are there areas maybe that they should be more focused in? Or is it the training involved? Like, what, what is causing this lagging? They're lagging because the problems of interdependence and the demands of the global society are growing at a pace that the institutions are not coping with. We started with the United Nations primarily to bring international peace and security, but also on issues related to global economy, especially the financial institutions. But around the economy, peace and security, human rights, global challenges, the United Nations and associated institutions have emerged as the crisis developed. And that is where, as the member states see the challenge coming, the response reaction is delayed reaction to the crisis that are evolving. But the good part of it is that these institutions, like the United Nations, have survived for now 67, 68 years. And more institutions have grown up. And there is a spirited effort by member states to evolve and develop other procedures and institutions to cope with the challenges. But still, the challenges are ahead of the institutional capabilities. Given that, as you've described, a lot of this is, is a response. You know, a crisis emerges, the international community then responds and then sets up a kind of architecture to deal with that response and then builds on how to prevent it and understand it and so forth. This, is that the sort of correct way of of seeing how these are evolving, or is there more of a targeted or strategic effort? I think this is the biggest challenge. Response is the norm in which we have been moving forward over the past 67 years. But there is need for a much more visionary uh, outlook and to see and anticipate what are the likely challenges that are to come forward. Now, in a multilateral setting, this kind of initiatives may emerge from member states or a collection of member states or should emerge from the leadership of the United Nations and to reach a consensus on what should be 
the forward-looking and visionary ideas, you have to sit and discuss. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the reasons where, although there may be richness in ideas and vision, mm -hmm. the need to sit and develop a consensus on what that vision should be translated in terms of institutions mm -hmm. may take time. And I, I'm glad you mentioned this idea of consensus. I mean, one of the criticisms you get, particularly of, of these large organizations, the UN included, is that the, the sort of developing countries, the poorer countries, their voices don't you know, count for as much. Um, I don't know if this perception is true, and maybe you can attest to that, but what can really be done to, to address that if it's an issue, and if not an issue, how to address that perception? It's definitely an issue. The evolution of these institutions were centered around the victors of the Second World War. It was those countries that has a military superiority, but also to some extent coincided with a relatively greater economic leverage. And in the process of bringing in new member states following the decolonization process, there was an advantage over those countries that had been at the starting point of these institutions. And that is why some of these countries, the victor countries, even built institutions primarily for security and peace governance around the Security Council. And the coming in of younger nations, disadvantaged from the very start, was an uphill struggle. And it's very true, the developing countries have come a long way but definitely catching up has been not easy. Although there is an encouraging track record that among the countries that joined the United Nations after the Second World War, although there are some developing countries, especially those from Latin America and a few from Africa, that were founding members of the United Nations, they were relatively poor economically with weak political institutions. But now they have emerged to become powerful nations. And therefore, this poverty, weakness is a relative thing. It may change over time, but the challenge and the onus is on those countries, member states, to transform themselves in order to acquire more power and exercise greater leverage in the international debates and platforms. What does the emergence of these entities, like BRICS, for example, what does that do in terms of shifting the way in negotiations are held or the kind of leverages that they have within the UN structure, but also within other you know, global governance systems? Like what, what does the challenge of BRICS really represent to, to global governance uh, systems? This is a very important development. First of all, it does represent a geographical self, mm. with the except, of course, of Russia, which is... In, in, in the north, but most of the BRICS countries, Brazil, India, South Africa, are from the south. And in relative terms, the south is the one that has been disadvantaged in relative to the geographical north. And the coming in of this does vindicate that it is possible for weak countries to be able to come to a position of ascendancy and influence. But also they are using the language, the debate of the developing countries. It signals that this is possible. And therefore, it brings a new equation on the table when you sit and discuss with the traditional powerful countries from the north, whether it is on the political, security, or economic arena. But it's very important that these countries, the emerging ones and forming blocks, should not form an inward-looking block, but seek to make it open-ended so that others can also come in. And since they are using the agenda of the developing countries to make sure that other developing countries are assisted and eventually empowered to be able to exercise greater leverage and influence on global issues, and issues that they can tap in order to enhance their national states' capabilities.
Uh, one of the major sort of controversial areas has been the Security Council. And you mentioned that a lot of these institutions were built around the Security Council with the victors of World War II. Um, I understand that there are, uh, there's an ongoing debate within the UN to expand potentially the number of permanent seats, the number of members, and so forth. But th the first question I want to ask you really is the status of the veto vote of those, those five countries. Is this something that is likely to change? Does this inhibit progress in, 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 in your opinion? Should it be ex extended to more countries? Should it be removed altogether? You know, what, what, what do we need this veto vote for? Is it outdated? It's important to know what the veto is all about. The veto was an agreement, an arrangement to balance the power of the victor powers in order to ensure that none of them would supersede and have an undue advantage, they introduced the veto. So it was a balancing act. So between themselves? Between really? themselves okay. uh, in the United Nations. But because it did confer certain powers to these five, the veto has survived. And we must understand that the veto is actually a negative power in that it is preventing one or the other from taking action or not taking action. We should seek to transform the veto into a positive power. Instead of being a negative power confined to a few, it should be a consensus approach to issues that have been controversial. But also the veto has been vested on the five permanent members, the victors as I said, but the membership of the United Nations has increased tremendously to 193, 94 almost now, and the number of the permanent members has remained at 15 for over 45 years. There was a slight increase in the 60s uh, from 13, from 12 to 15. Mm -hmm. But now time has come where the numbers have to increase mm -hmm. because the Security Council has the primary responsibility for issues of international peace and security. Mm -hmm. This is the core mandate of the United Nations Charter. But also the Security Council members, especially the permanent members, have had an undue influence on the United Nations. For example, the position of the top uh, position in the United Nations Secretariat mm -hmm. is always assured to the permanent five. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, they, they are assured of positions where the Under Secretary General for, mm -hmm. for this or for that, for political, for mm -hmm. For, peace, uh, for peacekeeping and those. Of course, there are others who are appointed at the discretion of the Secretary General, but the Permanent Five not only have influence in the Security Council, but also in the Secretariat. Mm. Now, coming back to the Security Council, there is an ongoing debate on how to reform the Security Council. First of all, do we need the Security Council? Yes, we do. But there are three crucial issues that have to be addressed in reforming the Security Council. The first one is numbers. Numbers in terms of permanent and non-permanent. Should we continue to have permanent members and non-permanent members or abolish that? I think that has got to be agreed upon. Secondly, should the numbers increase and increase by how much? Thirdly, is this veto. Should this veto be gradually abolished or should it be tamed by the working methods? By tamed is that conditions to be imposed upon which the veto can be used rather than left to the discretion of one or two permanent members. But eventually, as I say, since the veto is a negative power, it would make a lot of sense for accountability and for a democratic dispensation with the Security Council that decisions are arrived at by consensus rather than the will of one or two 
members imposed on the others with a bearing on the rest of the world. You should remember decisions of the Security Council have the force of international law. And there is a mandatory obligation by member states to abide by the decisions of the Security Council. And during your time within the UN, um, I understand that you were also the president of the Security Council for a period. What was that experience like? Now, first of all, let me put on record that Tanzania has been a member of the Security Council twice since its independence. The first time was in 1975 and 76. At that time, the permanent representative to the United Nations for Tanzania was uh, His Excellency Salim Ahmed Salim. And he was also president, the first Tanzanian president of the Security Council mm. for the month of January 1976. I had the privilege to lead Tanzania the second time as a non-permanent member of the Security Council from 2005 and 2006. And exactly 30 years later, in January 2006, I was the president of the Security Council. During the presidency of Tanzania, we had two priorities. The first one was to ensure that we advance the peace process in the Great Lakes in the wake of the genocide and the unprecedented refugee problem. So we prepared a resolution, which is not very usual, that non-permanent members prepare a resolution. And that resolution was adopted by consensus. I received ample and very encouraging cooperation from the permanent members. And the second priority was to strengthen the African Union and its partnership with the United Nations under Chapter 8 of the United Nations Charter. And these were areas where there were raging problems in Africa. And the Peace and Security Council of the African Union had just come into existence the first five years. And during our presidency and presidency in the Security Council, we sought to strengthen this partnership and to reckon and take into account the views of the Peace and Security Council of the African Union. It was a very educational, educate, educating experience, but at the same time, it was a time when the voice of a developing country, and Tanzania in particular, was articulating different international issues different from those of the, of the 70s, which were related to the decolonization and ending apartheid. But this time around, it was the issues related to peace and security in the continent of Africa. But also, this was the beginning of the debate on development and issues of poverty with the Millennium Development Goals. And during that time, we also had the privilege of co-chairing the beginning of a new institution in the United Nations called the Peace Building Commission, where Tanzania and Denmark chaired, drafted, and presented this resolution simultaneously in the Security Council and in the General Assembly. And the Peace and the Security, uh, the Peace Building Commission is one of the new additions to address problems of conflict relapse mm -hmm. after conflicts have been resolved. And I think this was one of the contributions mm -hmm. that Tanzania made as we were members of the Security Council. And I mean, just, just the functional day-to-day -day activities of being within the UN system, even, even as the president, how do you go about you know, building that consensus or pushing that agenda, like what is that process like? You have to begin incrementally. Mm -hmm. You have to begin with sub-regional groupings. We had to do a lot of caucusing and talking within the SADC countries, within the East African countries, and then within the African group, 
and then you move on to the group of 77. It is a process that needs a lot of consultations at different levels in order to build that kind of consensus. It's not easy, you have to bargain, you have to negotiate, and eventually there are difficult moments when there could be paralysis in the discussion. But also it depends on who is the leader at that point, whether it's the president of the Security Council or the president of the General Assembly. It's important that consensus building is itself an art mm -hmm. and has to be mastered. But it is an incremental process that begins with caucusing in small groups, preferably regional groupings and like-minded mm -hmm. countries which may belong to different regions, but do share certain ideals. And in that way, you keep on leveraging and building on what is emerging in those backdoor negotiations before they are tabled uh, for a vote. Uh, one of the other major conflicts besides the veto vote when it comes to global institutions has been the ICC, uh, particularly recently with, with Kenya now taking the position that it's, I think, intending to withdraw from the ICC, uh, given the, the allegations that have been ongoing. Uh, what, is your, what is your view or what is your assessment of this situation where there's a criticism whereby Kenya, most vocally, but several African states are saying, you know, the ICC is over-focused on Africa, that there are atrocities elsewhere. Is this a fair criticism in your opinion or... Is this just a perception that really is adding to the problem? No, first of all, we, we have to admit that getting an international criminal court was a big advancement in the international thinking on international criminal justice. We needed that kind of a court in order to address issues of impunity and, and the criminality in the international system which was leading to the lawlessness uh, in, in a, a, a global situation where there is weak governance without a government. Mm -hmm. you, you need institutions of justice. Mm -hmm. But also we should understand that from the very inception of the International Criminal Court with the Rome Statute, mm -hmm. it hit problems because some members refused to sign the Rome Statute, and they're not members of it. And the African countries came in great numbers to support this, which I think was a very positive uh, move to contribute to building international institutions. But it's true that the track record of late has been disturbing because there are more African cases at the court than elsewhere uh, in, in the world. There are also issues related to what is the relationship and the importance between justice and peace? What's the relationship between justice and sovereignty? And of course between politics and, and, and justice. The record is showing that predominantly African countries are the candidates in the ICC is of course disturbing. It doesn't mean that there haven't been uh, similar cases that deserve to be brought to the ICC in the other parts of the world. And this, there is enough ground for Africans to raise their eyebrows and concerns. But in the final analysis, on this issue of international criminal justice, the final word must come from the victims. Because we are addressing issues of impunity. The apparent discrimination, and indeed it could be more than apparent, is uh, a procedural issue of the court and the manner in which they carry out investigation. But there is also, unfortunately, a lot of political meddling in the decision on which case to come to the court and which case shouldn't come to the court. The independence of the court has been interfered with by big players in the international community. And there is nothing as serious and dangerous when the, the judicial system 
loses its independence mm. to political and the strategic interest of larger powers than others. There is a lot to be improved. The institutions has merits and the victims are crying for justice. It's not only in Africa, everywhere else. And the voice of the people, the voice of the public, the media must come to voice these concerns of the discriminatory nature of the proceedings and even the benchmarking of the criteria for taking cases to the ICC. But that does not nullify the importance and justification for having an international institutions to oversee international criminal justice. But is, is the ICC you know, just symptomatic of a larger problem with global governance institutions whereby, yes, there's broad consensus, there's agreement, people have signed treaties that they're willing to cooperate, but there's a, there's a lacking implementing power that, say, a government would have. Uh, is that not, you know, is this not really just an extension of that problem, whereas, you know, if someone wants, they can move out of the ICC, essentially, like Kenya's, you know, allegedly looking to do. Does that not, uh, not cheapen, but does not, that not um, somehow hamper the effectiveness of that particular institution, but also of global governance systems generally? This is the shortcoming, this is the weakness that will always persist in international governance. There is a willingness to surrender sovereignty for a common good. There is a willingness to create institutions and agree on procedures but there will always be a lack of enforcement mechanisms. And this is the, the nature of, of the beast, so to speak, mm. so-called global governance. Mm. Uh, there is political will, but it can be withdrawn. Mm -hmm. uh, there is consensus, which can be broken. And there isn't an international enforcement mechanism uh, in, in global governance. And certainly there are grounds for dissatisfaction uh, with the ICC in the way it is going on. And as I said, some countries, big countries actually, didn't even want to sign it from the very beginning. Mm. How, whatever the merits of the of Rome Statute may be, but other countries have stayed out of it. And there is no way you can compel them to go. But we must also understand that the maturity credibility of international governance must also be tempered with morality. What is good and what is bad? There are issues that must be embarked upon for their goodness for global existence and multilateral uh, harmony. And if there isn't that kind of normative goodwill towards international governance, this inherent weakness for lack of accountability and enforcement will always undermine global governance and multilateralism. Thank you, Ambassador. But just to, to sort of close off and round up the interview, looking ahead now, say to 2030, you know, what will the world look like? What will be the status of, of global governance systems? I can see three areas where action is very slow and it could develop into a crisis in another 10 or 15 years. One is in the area of population growth and international migration. As poverty continues, unemployment grows, young people have no opportunities in developing countries, they would seek to move to other countries. And unless there are opportunities at home, people will continue to go to other places. And this issue of poverty, employment and global movement of people, unless it is addressed comprehensively, is going to create a crisis. The second is in the area of climate change. There's been foot dragging and we are witnessing this catastrophic development in the atmosphere as we recently saw in the Philippines. And this is going to be a serious reality which may even lead to increased hunger and affect food production. 
If these issues are not addressed quickly, they are going to develop into a crisis. But I am optimistic that in 2030, first of all, there will be a new generation of leadership in the world. There will also be a new generation of the global public opinion, a generation that will be more educated, more informed, more enlightened, and they should be able to address these issues more effectively than this current generation can do. We should also understand that the media has grown into a powerful tool, both the traditional media and the social media, where global public opinion is part of the decision making in governments. In this globalized world, it's not only member states, it is the private sector, it is the media, it is the technological advancement that are playing a role in major decision making. So the interplay of these new actors in the international system, 15 years from now, I believe will be able to face the challenges that we are facing. Let me also add that among the challenges we are facing now is those related to peace and security with the international terrorism and international criminality. We are not coping fast enough with these challenges and we shouldn't allow this to develop into serious crisis and by talking it helps to understand and to move quickly. The combination of an informed, enlightened public opinion, a more articulate and free press, and the means of communication and technology that we are witnessing through the social media, we should have to have a critical mass of views and a, a new generation of thinking that will carry us through uh, the challenges that we see emerging now. And I'm very optimistic that 30 years from now, or 15 years from now, by 2030, those problems will be faced. And probably there'll be new problems. <laughs> that is what change and development is all about. Well, on that positive note, thank you very much for your time. And hopefully we'll be able to interview you again and ask you more about the challenges and the functions of global governance systems. But thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to come to Wongo the Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us and join us again soon for another program of In Focus brought to you by the Wongo the Institute. Goodbye.